strong enough and powerful enough to fulfill his promise to give uh, uh, to, to him and to Sarah a child. Um, what's, the greater, what's the greater sin there, if you want to grade them? Unbelief. Unbelief. A, a slap in God's face. You're not going to keep your promise. The adultery is bad. The slapping of God in the face, that's worse. That is worse. That's Father Abraham. We heard about him, right? He's the one dealing with Lazarus and the rich man. Uh, he's, he's, a, he's a hero. Anything else messy about Father Abraham? Carl. A couple times he passed out his wife as his sister so that um, another born Carl would take her as his wife. And again, he didn't trust God that he would protect her and take care of her. Sure, blatant distrust there, okay? Anything else messy, Father Abraham? All right. Uh, so it depends when you would have talked with him. <laughs> would you be comfortable or not? And when he's leading his servants to go rescue Lot and his family, oh yeah, we'll be comfortable. This, this guy's doing the concubine thing, really? Ooh, yuck. Uh, let's move on. How about Moses? Another great hero of faith. Any messies you know about him? Once again, Genesis will be your go-to book. Rick. With the Egyptians, when the Israelites saw an argument between the Sure. Hey, we're getting a theme here. God needs our help, so it's okay for us to sin. It's okay for us to sin because God needs our help. Uh, that, that's Abraham's modus operandi. Now Moses is doing that same thing. Uh, he brought up the killing of the Egyptian slave master. Somehow he knew. Somehow. We're not told all the details. He knows he's supposed to lead the people of Israel out of slavery. And, and well, God, you know, you're, you're taking too long. I'll, I'll get things going for you uh, through murder. You know, I, I can do that. Any other messy? I don't know. Right, again, the, the, the blasphemy that, that gets God's uh, anger. Uh, blasphemy, taking glory and credit uh, from God for himself, okay? Any other ones? Gary. Uh, Moses argued with God at the burning bush as to whether or not he should be a leader that God wanted him to be. Mm-hmm. He came up with excuses mm-hmm. to God. Big, strong Moses is also wimpy, 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 right? Uh, so the, when do you get him? Strong time, messy time. Uh, how about King David? Adultery. Yeah, there, there again, bla- adultery and along with it, murder. murder and along with it, attempted deception uh, and along with it, uh, what's, what's the example for his people? He's in a, he's in a dual role, um, that, 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 that this uh, nation has a king who's, who's also a, a, a spiritual leader at the same time, and, and that's, the, that's the, the lesson he gives. Uh, let's move on quickly. Peter, Apostle Peter, one of those reputed to be the pillars of the early Christian church. Dennis. Denial of our Lord. Denial of our Lord, and... Yes? Sure, try, trying to dissuade Christ from the cross, yep. Uh, I think the, 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 the self-confidence rather than the God-confidence. Uh, how about Paul? Rick? Yeah, messy, messy, messy. So messy... Do you know approximately how long of a time frame it took before he got the public right hand of fellowship from the other apostles after his conversion? And we, we, we read Acts and it's all kind of, uh-uh-uh. Three years. Uh-uh. That three years was where he spent in the desert uh, and the, the indications would be that our Lord Jesus in some way directly instructed him uh, so uh, remember, to be called an apostle, you must uh, have been uh, taught by Jesus. Uh, you must have witnessed him 
uh, as the resurrected Lord, and you must have the signs, wonders, and, and, and uh, miracles that were uh, uh, God's way of showing, yes, these are gonna be word bringers for you. Uh, I saw another hand, I missed it. Where was the hand? Amy, was that you? No, Beth. The three is correct? It was not correct. It is also not correct. We can keep guessing. <laughs> um, uh, d- depending on which way you're going to count it, you'll, you'll find some say 12, sometimes 15. I, I kind of lean that. They, they, they wait a long time before they trust this guy. They wait a long time. That, that's how messy he was. I'm not saying it was right or wrong. I'm just saying that's what happens when you deal with messy people. You want to, ugh. Okay, so that's all we wanted to do. Um, uh, the, the, the group part, we are going to, uh, at some point, I want you just to keep your eyes open uh, for opportunities that the Lord has provided to you. It's just good to share with others. Jess had shared one at a campground last time. We're going to do more, but for right now, we're going to move on to our next uh, video. So this will be the one that goes with lesson three. So you're on lesson three, and uh, you're at the part of watching video segment one. This will be the longer section. Here we go. Welcome back to Let's Go. In our first two lessons, we were reminded of just how great God's love for us is and encouraged to show the same love to the people God has brought into our lives. Now it's time to learn about the second important step in connecting those people to the gospel of Jesus Christ. This second step may surprise you because we tend to think that witnessing is all about what we say. And what we say is important, of course, But when we witness, it is also terribly important that we listen. In our next lesson, Professor Mark Paustian is going to let Jesus and his apostles show us why it is so important that we listen to others. And he will show us some techniques to help us listen more carefully. I have a question for you. What was it like to be with Jesus when he walked among us as God in real human flesh? Our minds may run first to the extraordinary things Jesus did, telling a storm, just be quiet, and it did, telling a dead child to get up, and she did, and so on. When the apostles tell us to be imitators of God, do the things he did, be the way he was, Well, it can't mean turning water into wine, can it? But instead, live a life of love because you find yourself so well loved by God himself. What we can hope to imitate as we ask him to help us is simply how Jesus treated people and how he was present with them. These things are extraordinary too, just in a different way. Here's what I mean. Think of the risen Jesus asking a disarming open question to those two distraught disciples walking to Emmaus. What are you talking about as you walk along the road? Notice the question, open them up and let them pour out their grief. Think of the more penetrating questions Jesus would ask people. The first recorded words of Jesus to Peter were when he asked him, what do you want? You can find times Jesus put words to what other people were feeling as he took the time to notice them and weigh their words and read what was written on their faces. Martha, he said, you are worried about many things. In one place in the Gospels we read, Jesus looked at him and loved him. And to think that what the man had just said was that he believed that he had kept the law of Moses all his life of all the moments to treat someone as warmly as Jesus did. Something about the sort of attention Jesus offered in that moment just overwhelmed the writer. It was something he could never forget. Jesus looked at him and loved him. Once you know Jesus and know his heart, you find you can open up to him entirely and tell him anything. He was someone that was safe to question with the hard questions at the bottom of your heart. I think of that when Martha dared to say to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Or we read this priceless detail. She told him everything. 
That's in the account of Jesus healing a woman who had long suffered from some sort of blood disease. She told him everything. That must have taken a while. Jesus must have graced her with a warm way of connecting with her that told her, go on, I'm here, I'm listening. Tell me everything. What was it like to be with Jesus? Ask it another way. Ask, what is it like to be listened to, to be taken seriously, to be the object of the undivided attention of the Son of God? And then, when Jesus spoke, took his turn, he was able to speak to the deepest things people hide inside. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. These next three lessons are an exploration of active listening. We intend to offer people our full, warm attention and our deep and genuine interest to truly take them in. We hope to disarm them with friendly questions or challenge them with powerful ones. We can reflect in our words what we see in their faces. This is hard for you to talk about. Or you really cared about her in a way that can help people open up to us and can draw out their stories. We want to learn how to get down to what things are really about for them, to gain a richly layered understanding, then and only then to say, may I share something with you? We can learn a lot about listening from the apostles. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. That's James chapter 1, verse 19. In context, the brother of our Lord is deeply concerned about how we handle our anger or impatience toward people with whom we disagree. There is an area of communication study that especially deals with strong disagreement and that helps us to imagine a better response than to immediately go on the offensive with a barrage of words or to vent our frustration over people daring to challenge us. It is known as the art of ethical dialogue. Here are just some of its components. See if these responses don't help us to imagine what it can look like or sound like when we take the Apostle James seriously. Confirmation. We can confirm people even as we are in disagreement. We can tell them how much they matter to us, and we can comment on the good things we detect in their point of view. What you're saying is important to me. I really appreciate your honesty and how seriously you take these things. Here's the question. Must people agree with you as a condition they must meet before you will treat them warmly? Empathy. In this context, empathy means that we can understand what might make a people think or feel a certain way, especially about Christian truth, even if we cannot agree with them. Here's the question. As you consider where this person has been in life and what they've been exposed to, can you make sense of how they th think? Would you think any differently if God had not revealed Christ to you by his spirit in word and sacrament? Presentness. When people are expressing opinions that are offensive to all your Christian sensibilities, they deny God or do real harm to people. We might feel tempted to completely disengage with the conversation or even remove ourselves physically. Here's the question. When it comes to your longing to bring the truth to people in an authentic way that they can hear and understand, what are the reasons to remain fully present? Supportive climate. Given that people may need to hear the message of Christ crucified and raised many, many times before the truth breaks in through the working of the Holy Spirit, we want to give serious thought to how we can keep a conversation going over weeks or even years. We don't want our talks to be so obnoxious that a person won't ever want to experience us in this way again. Here's the question. Will these conversations be pleasant enough that people won't at all mind talking about these things with us again? Let's discuss this. Which of these qualities challenge you the most when you are in strong disagreement? Why? Please pause the video and spend some time discussing your answers to these questions. Allow up to 10 minutes for this discussion. And after the 
All right, so if I could draw your attention to the, uh, what le- it says listen, lesson one. Um, so it is actually lesson three in this thing, but it's listen, lesson one. And let's uh, um, look at some of the things that uh, Pastor, uh, Professor Pastor Paustian uh, talked about and uh, see how they might help us. It asked us to, as you watch the video, jot down examples of when Jesus was lovingly present with people. Uh, what did he do with the Emmaus disciples? What was highlighted? To be present. Jim? He listened, right? And, and he, what did he, what did he say? Darlene? What are you talking about? Uh, the, the presentness of communication. What are you talking about? So, when I do pre-marriage counseling, um, one of the things we always go through with them is uh, uh, here's the top five ways that Satan attacks marriages as far as we can tell these days. And, and uh, why don't we understand that and take a potential weakness and make it into our strength? Oh, I wonder if you guys know. Do you know what the top five reasons are given by all marriage counselors, Christian or non, uh, when a marriage uh, has failed. Do you know what the top five reasons are for marriage failure in the United States of America? Amy? Finances is one or two every single year. Um, they, don't, uh, they don't know uh, how to handle money together. Uh, you've probably heard, if you have, my ears always pick it up, it's called financial infidelity. Uh, where they're, they're, uh, one spouse is, is cheating on the money and they're, they, they, it's, it ends up being a big old fight and, and a mess. Okay, Jim? Issues with in-laws and other family Certainly, family issues is, is generally number four. Family issues has to do with exactly what he's saying. One in-law, or I, I call it former primary family, has too much influence on the new primary family, and it just, the, the, the one who's getting kind of pushed out of the marriage is, is it, they just can't handle it. Or I also include with their children come along and the mom and dad forget that the first relationship was the marriage relationship, and they put all their energy into the, to the raising of kids, and, and then, then what happens there can be, uh, the kids get up, uh, move out, and grow up and they say, well, I guess our co-op's purpose has ended. <laughs> so the co-op doesn't need to exist anymore. It wasn't a marriage, it was a co-op uh, for the purpose of raising children. Or they disagree so strongly on the way of raising those kids that it becomes a, a real or perceived choosing of kids over the marriage spouse. Um, so that's their number four. Laura? Communication is always number one or two. If finances and communication flip-flop um, uh, each and every uh, year. Uh, and uh, we'll talk more, that's what I wanted to get to coming up. Uh, your other ones, sexual issues, and that can be infidelity or anything else. The fifth one I wanna see if you guess. This is number five, but. Jessica? Health? Nope. Kirsten? Religion, it's always number five. So one is very and the other is not. And it just starts to grate on the very or the other uh, one is trying to pull them away. It just becomes a, a point for I say, hey, great. So we see Satan's been using this. Let's make every single one of them a strength is the point of the pre-marriage counseling session. Communication was a fun. So normally when I talk about communication, there's lots of things he's gonna bring up, but I'll, I'll, I'll do a little illustration with them. I say, who wants to talk with me? And someone will talk and I'll have a conversation. Maybe we'll talk Packers or something else. In the course of the conversation, I'll say, uh, uh, you know, um, ask some questions and I'll pull up my phone and I'll start scrolling through and blah, blah, blah. And then the point that I'm trying to make is that's poor communication because I'm, sharing my attention, there's no eye contact. Well, I just recently had two police officers who are getting married go through that class, and, and uh, um, when I said, so what, what, what was, why was that bad communication? And she said, you're, you're asking close-ended questions. I never thought, that, that was, you know, what, you didn't pick up how rude I was being? No, I'm like, oh, that was a good reminder. Conversations work best with open-ended questions. What were, you, what were you guys talking about? They could have said anything. Um, but the open-ended led to a much better, so 
Apparently, our, our police officers know when they are talking uh, with, with people, ask the open-ended question. That was the first thing that jumped out. Good, good reteaching. Um, so, uh, how about with, with, with Peter? What was the way he was present with them? Remember that one? He asked that question. Darlene? What do you want? Yeah, okay, let, let, let's see where this is going. What's on this person's mind? How about to, with Martha? Amy? He, he acknowledged where she was at. Um, how about Mar, uh, Martha again? What did Martha say? Darlene? If you, so, so what's, what, what, what kind of a statement is that? Besides conditional, I know that. Huh? Yeah, there's a, there's a little, there's a, there's an edge to it. And so Jesus immediately set her in her place. No, timing is important. Did she need to be set in her place? Yeah, timing is important. That was not the time. She's hurting. I'm, I'm just gonna let her hurt. And, and she might say things that are untrue. She might say things that are blaming someone else, but timing is so important. We're just gonna let that one lie for right now, okay? That was a way to listen and, and show love. And then um, uh, the, the, uh, the woman who he healed with the, the, the bleeding disease. Darlene? She told him everything. She told him everything. And guys in here all smile. How long did that take? <laughs> but he was present. He did it. He, 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 he listened to the many, many, many words. You know, what, was there something more important to get to? Yeah. A better conversation? Yeah. But first, he, he let her get out all her words, all right? Uh, the next one, I, I think, is very helpful. You know, it just it kind of... It kind of hits me in the face a little bit, so whether you are, where you are at, I don't know. The components of the ethical dialogue uh, that were mentioned. And, and it was, he said this was components of ethical dialogue with someone you have a strong disagreement with. That's the catch. Someone you have a strong disagreement with. What were those components? Jim? Sorry. Did you have a different question? Pardon? Yeah, so as, uh, as you applied yourself to, to word and sacrament, the, the Lord increased your faith and you're able to control some words and actions and that, that comes along. So anyway, the, the ethical dialogue with someone you have strong disagreement with. We're gonna come back to that. It is very easy to have ethical dialogue, as we'll talk about it, with someone you're in complete agreement with. But this is gonna different one and we'll set up a, a setting for that. And what do you got? You want the four of them? Sure. Confirmation is correct. Empathy, Empathy number two. Presentness. Presentness number three. And supportive, and supportive climate is number four. 
Um, so again, remember the setup here is someone you will have a strong disagreement with. In the context of our witnessing our Christian faith, what might that practically speaking be like, look like, sound like? Who might be, give, can you come up with an example, real or fake or however you want, of someone you might have a strong disagreement with? Janelle. Could be a family member, yep, and they, they believe uh, that, you know, well, uh, you know, you, it's not necessary to believe in Jesus to be saved. You just got to be a good person. You're going to have a strong disagreement. We know only Jesus saves. There is no way, there is absolutely no way we are ever going to agree to a statement that apart from Christ you can be saved. They're, they're, we're going to have a strong disagreement there. Any other ones? Josh. <laughs> Politics can cause for some strong disagreements. Colleen. A former neighbor who said, don't shove your religion down my throat. All right, so uh, someone who did not control uh, their way, could they control? Probably as an unbeliever, has no Holy Spirit living in them. Uh, uh, is, it, is it really reasonable for us to expect spirit-like behavior from those who do not have the spirit? It isn't, but that, that's, that's what we want, that's what we look for. So some of the strong agreement, confirmation, this one was important, normally confirmation, yep, I agree with you, that's not what it meant here. In this context, confirmation is simply that you're listening to them, that you care about them, and they might say something you can agree with, and at least, well, maybe I can see where you're coming from that. I, I can see, uh, there's an example I'm gonna point out, I just think of, of this, uh, you know, um, uh, someone is uh, just, there, there is no God. We're gonna have a strong disagreement. Um, but to, to, to spend enough time to find out why does she say that? And then you might find out that she was molested as a child and you've been telling her how good God is and he's with you always and had a different other tragedy and another, tra can, can we understand now a little bit where all that hurt is coming from? It doesn't mean I have to, and I think the point here is if you do that, when you're letting them know they matter to you and they matter enough that you're actually gonna listen to what they have to say without immediately slamming on the disagreement, kind of like Jesus did with Martha. Um, that's just the confirmation that they're a valuable person. Uh, the, the, the empathy, uh, that's where I would go into next. Why are, they, why are they holding on to these wrong thoughts? What happened in their life that they cannot see God for his love. What has happened to them? You know, and, and, and you're dealing with those things and you have to say, yeah, that was awful. I'm sorry and, and, and I, I can't, I, I'm not the Lord himself. Um, I, I can't tell you all the whys, but I can tell you how much he loves you. It goes to Jesus. Presentness is the other one. Normally, uh, what is, I think this is universally normal, what is the normal reaction uh, when, when you're, you're with someone or near someone or you, you realize we have a strong disagreement? Check out. Avoidance. It's a technique. Um, hardly anyone loves confrontation. There are a select few people who thrive on it, the contrarian. Um, but, but most people simply do not like it. And a way of dealing with it is Run away, run away. Some people might recognize that, we'll see. Uh, run away. Um, uh, so, but presentness is stick around, stick around. Dennis. What do you do when you have a, a family member that you knew grew up as a Christian and they give you answers that are unbiblical and you know that they've been through the Bible so they know that's correct. So they're saying, if I had a God that wasn't, was caring, he wouldn't do this. And you say, well, we're all sinners, and it's because of our sin that he's doing it, not, not because he's an unloving God. So Dennis presents the situation of a family member who grew up and was faithfully taught uh, the, the, the truths of God's word, 
and now they're, they're thinking uh, otherwise. He says, what, what do you do? Uh, what do you say with that? Just if we kind of put some of these into practice, um, maybe let me just quickly comment on supportive climate, and then let's come back to that, because that's a real, true, frequent example. Uh, supportive climate, what was meant by that? He, he's, he said some things that for supportive climate that maybe caught your attention. Colleen? Keep the conversation going. Keep the conversation going. Uh, have I, has my talk been in such a winsome way, a pleasant way, that, um, that they're willing to speak with me again, even though he said might take weeks or years? Okay, supportive climate, yeah. I've, I, I at least have not, I've not shut the door in someone's face. I've not done that. Um, uh, they, they might shut the door, but, but I have not. So let's go back to uh, Dennis's question. Family member, grew up, was faithfully taught the Lord's truth, uh, maybe, maybe uh, was, was uh, saying the, the, the beautiful praises to Jesus like we had in our first service and the kids will do in the second service, uh, did all that, and now they're, they're contrarian about God. Uh, if we try to put some of these into practice, what, what might we do? Josh, was your hand to the point or you had something else? Okay, I'll come back to you. Okay, what's, what's some, Dale? So, so that might be just to, just to kind of try to gently get them back there. Jim? Yeah, so you, you, you're probably not going to close the deal in one day, right? Jim, you had your hand. Um, just some caring questions. What, what does that mean? What do you think God thinks? Yeah. Well, I think a lot of times it, it is a human event or action that someone reverts to God. Sure, okay. So well, they didn't talk to him in church, but God's Sure, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I take the, the sin of people out, out on, on God. I, that, that's something I, uh, I, I've used in, in certain situations is, hey, I can understand how you feel that way, but please don't take it out on Jesus. If you want to take it out on me, that's fine. Please don't take it out on Jesus. He's still worthy of your praise. He's still worthy of your devotion. He's still worthy of your loyalty, even if I'm not. Uh, he is, so... Uh, that, that, that would be something. But I think his, your, your point is the good one. We've we got to find out what did they live through, what happened, why do they now feel that way? And that means some of those open-ended questions that you've got you to gotta start with. Um, and then the, the, there's two things that I, I want for, because uh, there's probably every single person in this room has, the, might, might just be immediate family, at least an extended family. You have uh, a Dennis Dobler question. Someone who grew up knowing, yep, had it all, had it all, and they're away. Uh, we all have that. Um, so a couple, couple of things is, to the best of your ability, maintain that presence. Um, try to find out the why. And then there's, there's two truths we always need to remember. Uh, sometimes God simply reserves timing for himself. And the key is not gonna be my uh, wise, logical arguing them back into uh, what, in all honesty, down in there, they, they, they probably still might even have a spark of or, or even know. It's gonna be the Holy Spirit through the word that finally is going to click them. So I wanna maintain that presence. I wanna listen. That There is something to this that at some point, by listening, you've earned the right to be listened to. 
And, and you, you want to find out what happened. Maybe they just got to get their hurt out. Maybe it's just, it's just they got to get that hurt out, and, and, and maybe you're going to be the, the one who receives it, uh, receives the, 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 the ugh, um, but maybe they got to get that out. So I would say to the best of your ability, maintain that presence. Do find some time to loving, caring. Hey, why do you feel that way? Without the argument, not expecting to close the deal in a day. Um, that, that's, where, that's where I would go and uh, continue to do that. And you know, I, I think the Lord will let you know when it's the right time. Uh, or he might be just simply reserving for himself and his glory something he is going to allow or do uh, to uh, get, get, give that what's needed, okay? Um, Josh. So t- timing is important. Any God's time ladies in here? Uh, what's our little standard phrase with um, uh, what's true in any emotional situation? Hurt people, hurt people, and who jumps up first? The sinful nature is first man off the bench. Any emotional sin- sin- uh, situation. Uh, so you, you think of it, uh, why uh, when someone scores a touchdown do they gloat and get in someone else's face? They're so, uh, sinful nature, whoo, I'm emotional. Ah! Sinful nature is, is generally driving that vehicle at the time. And it is almost always going to be a sinful nature reaction. Uh, it's not going to be, let me pause and give glory to the Lord. Because uh, you're emotional. Double down if it's a negative emotion. Double down. Uh, you, 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 you got almost a 100% chance this is going to be a sinful nature reaction that's coming, uh, coming up right away in me. So what's probably coming up in you? Ooh, S- Sam Ting, right? Um, where was my hand? Laura. If the passion doesn't match the problem, you're dealing with another problem. It might be wise for you to try to figure that one out. Uh, as to you know why this one simple thing blew up into what in the world? <laughs> Sheesh. Uh, so yeah, but guess what? You're gonna have to have empathy and presentness and a supportive climate uh, for that to happen. I mean that that's tough. So um, the question that they just want us to ask, and it's probably a good ending for today: Which of the qualities of ethical dialogue challenge you the most when you are in a strong disagreement? So at your tables, discuss that for three minutes. Which which is the hardest to do? Con- so if you don't have them written down, confirmation. That means trying to let them know that you care about them, even though you are not agreeing with what they're saying. Empathy uh, means. I understand this person either does not have Jesus in the life, does not have the Holy Spirit, therefore cannot act like a spirit-driven person, they do not have the ability, or, um, you know what, they might have some life experiences that were much different than mine. They might have some some of those super hard things that God never asked me to deal with. Uh, Presentness, instead of wanting to disengage and run away because this Strong disagreement is uncomfortable. We, we don't like that. And supportive climate, uh, that means talking in a winsome way so that uh, I haven't shut the door on a further conversation. So go at your table. Um, I, I think personally for me, I'll say every single one of these is tough. You pick one and say, uh, pick, pick one and why. Why is that hard for you? Go ahead.
All right, everyone, if you could bring your attention back, please. There's no right or wrong answer to what is most difficult for me. <laughs> it's what you thought was most difficult. So just kind of think about those things that we talked about, and we can practice them, and that can help us. Uh, the other part of this class is we learned uh, last time that, you know, when you're doing some of this stuff, you have to make yourself vulnerable. Uh, that means you gotta let people see you have weaknesses too. So before you go, your ticket to leave is at your table, you must reveal something to those at the table that they probably did not know about you. I, it doesn't have to be anything big or major. I will start. Here's my revelation. Uh, I wore girls' underwear. All right, all right, now hold it here. Paul Harvey says there's got to be a rest of the story in there somewhere. There is. <laughs> so one time we're sitting there, one of the things my family did was my parents took lots of pictures and made them into slides. Some of you know what those are. And then every once in a while for a Friday night, it would be pull out the slides and we sit as a family and popcorn and watch them and you know, lots of stuff and laughter. Watch a set of slides from a camping trip that we'd taken. I think my brother Dave was a year old and I, we were probably like, four or five, maybe five, six, and, and there's a slide, so we're at the beach, we're like, hey, what are we wearing? And my mom's like, oh, well, you know, we, the times were tough back then, and <laughs> you didn't have any swimsuits, and, and some of your sister's underwear that we still had would work, so they were, that was our swimsuit. <laughs> my mom did that. I'm like, sheesh, and there's a picture of it. And you can't have it. All right, get your ticket. Go.